Psalm 40, the benefits of patiently waiting. This psalm was designed for this modern, get it right now, microwave, can't wait culture. Y'all might not want to admit it, but we are a right now culture. We got to have stuff right now, right today. Waiting is not even a, uh, a word in the vocabulary of this modern day technology, technological, gotta have it right now, culture. I thought about the fact that there was a time when, when uh, our forefathers, if they wanted to know something, they would have to wait for weeks or months to get the answer. Today you can hop on the internet while you are sitting where you are and get the answer just like that. If you wanted to uh, wash some clothes or cook with some water back in that day, you would have to walk down to the creek. No, Y'all don't know nothing about this kind of stuff. Bring the water back. And if you wanted some hot water, you'd have to go get the wood too and build a fire. Y'all stop clapping, y'all don't know nothing about that. If you wanted some biscuits, mama would have to make the biscuits from scratch. Now y'all might know something about that. There was no easy bake, pop them out, Pillsbury Doughboy, just roll it out, put it on the oven, stick it in the oven, put it on the pan, come out, bam, 10 minutes there, you got some, some biscuits. No! It wasn't none of that. It was from scratch. Whether you and I realize it or not, there are some benefits of, of learning how to wait on some things. When I first got married 31 years ago uh, to the beautiful bride of my wife, Trina Jenkins. We got married and moved into our domicile and all we had was a bed. Didn't really need much more than that. Come on, y'all stop perpetrating like y'all don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and we slowly, <laughs> we slowly had to build, slowly had to fill the environment, slowly as we got the, the, the couches and the chairs and the dinette set. And, but not with this modern day society, they want to move in to their place of abide fully furnished. We'd all, they, they're going to debt to do it. They will stretch themselves out financially instead of we're learning how to patiently. And I thought I ought to talk today because I believe that there's some people who are in the midst of something that you're going through and perhaps you've been going through it for a while and as quiet as it is kept, th even though you may not verbalize it, you may not say it, you may not articulate it to anybody, but deep down in the inner recesses of your heart and your mind, there are some issues that you have as to why God has not responded to your situation much quicker than he has. If y'all all say amen together, nobody will know I'm talking about you. If you all say amen together, nobody will know that deep down inside you're wondering why God has promoted somebody else but not you. Deep down inside, you have that question as to why somebody else got a job but not you. Deep down inside, you're wondering, why in the world am I struggling like this? Why is my marriage jacked up? Why did so-and-so get married and my knight in shining armor has not showed up? Matter of fact, every joker that shows up who I think, think might be a knight in shining armor, it turns out to be a squeaky, a uh, rusted joker, why, what, what is wrong? Why, why is God not responding? And I thought for a few moments this morning that I would, I would try to tell somebody today that there are some benefits to patiently waiting on God. I, I wanted to highlight the fact that if we would have the right attitude and the right spirit while we wait for God to bring the solution to our dilemma, we would, be, we would recognize that there are in fact some benefits to us waiting on the Lord. 
As a matter of fact, I like what this text says. David the psalmist starts off the very first verse by unveiling to us the benefits of, some own, of, of what has happened in his own personal life. We don't know exactly when this occurred in his life, but he testifies. He says, I waited patiently for the Lord. I like that. Now let's look clearly what he waited for. He waited patiently for the Lord. See, some of us are waiting on the wrong person and the wrong people and the wrong things. He says, I waited for the Lord. You see, we must get going and preach, Pastor. We must get our mindset as to who it is that we're waiting on. We got to put our focus not on Capitol Hill, not on our senators or congress people, not on the governor, not on the city council. We cannot put our hope in our husbands or our wives, not on our bank account, not on the mortgage company. We have to wait patiently for the Lord, Jehovah Jireh, the God that provides. And he said, I waited patiently. This word waited patiently is a complex Hebrew word. As a matter of fact, it's so complex that it takes two English words to describe this one Hebrew word. And here's what the word means. The word in the Hebrew that has been translated into English, waited patiently, means this. It means, to, it means two things combined into one. It means to be in a position of hope and expectation. It means I am staying in a posture of being hopeful and having expectation. Somebody say hopeful and expectation. In other words, it means I am in a status of always looking and expecting God to do something. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Before you clap on that, let me tell you though, it doesn't mean just to be looking. It also means that while I'm looking, I will stay bound and connected with God. I think I need to give that to y'all again. It means I am in a position of hope and expectation. I am looking, I'm expecting, I'm expecting God to move. I'm expecting God to do something. And while I'm expecting him to do something, I'm gonna still walk with God and stick with God. Here's where people mess up. We falter on one way or the other. Most of us will have expectations of God, but when he does not respond in the time frame that we give to him, we get upset, quit church, quit reading our Bible, quit praying, quit talking to God about it, and so we falter on patiently waiting. Go on and preach, Pastor. I think that I will. As a matter of fact, when you are in a posture of waiting patiently, you won't backslide. You don't get tired. You don't get weary. You don't resort to taking matters into your own hand. You don't, you don't decide that since God didn't respond as quickly as you wanted him to respond, that you'll go ahead and fix it yourself. Anybody knows that when you try to fix your situation by your own strength and power, you only make things get worse. You know what I discovered? I discovered that God has been God a long time. Y'all excuse me for a second. And what I discovered about God is that he knows what he's doing and he does not need my assistance. Y'all excuse me for a second. Somebody tell your jacked up joker neighbor, God don't need your help. Y'all didn't say it with enough attitude. Y'all didn't say it with much fervor. I need you to rock your head, sisters. I need you to put that finger up in the face and say, God does not need your help. You make things worse. You make it more complicated. Go ahead, Ty, tell that sister, get your mouth off the situation. Go ahead, tell her. Tell her, get your hands out of the pot. Get yourself out of the deal and let God work on the situation. You know what I discovered? While God is working on the situation, he's actually working on you. Y'all excuse me for a second. He's actually fixing you and building character in you and shaping, go on and preach, Pastor. He's actually developing, developing some character in you. A whole lot of us could use some patience. We could use the ability to wait on God to step in and what I discovered, and another thing while I'm on this thing, I discovered that God may not respond as quickly or within the timetables that I want him to, but what I do know is when he shows up, it is absolutely always right on time. Do I have any witnesses? Does anybody here know that when God shows up, it's the right time? 
if he comes too early, if he comes when I want him to come, I wouldn't have learned how, I wouldn't have learned that he's a God that can move even when I have exhausted all of my resources and when I've gotten down to what I have no more. Sometimes you got to wait until you have nothing else but God before he steps into the situation and makes it work out. I wish I had a praying crowd with me here. I won't backslide, I won't resort to my own methods, I won't try to reshape it, I won't try to pressure God. Patiently waiting means that I am hopeful and have a great expectation and I'm going to stick with God even if he doesn't answer as fastly or as quickly as I want him to. Well, somebody say, well, Pastor, how in the world can I do that? Yeah, I feel the feedback, I feel the tension in the room. There's a quiet underlying current underneath the surface of your calm faces there's a under you know underneath the water there can be some current that can take you away and and though y'all look calm and saved and sophisticated on the surface underneath the water is a brewing current of people who want to stand up and holler and say pastor I'm tired of waiting and and why should I wait I, I, I know I feel your pain I, I feel you hollering out at me and saying well teach me pastor how to wait because I am at my wits end I'm about to go crazy up in here up in here I'm I, I, I'm about to lose my mind. I'm about to cuss somebody out. I, I'm about to give somebody a piece of my mind. If you don't tell me, Pastor, how to wait patiently, I'm about to do something that I'm going to regret. Calm down, calm down. I'm about to give you the answer of why and how you can wait. Here's the first thing, it's right here in the text. It says it so quickly. He says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and here's how and why. He says, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. Y'all see that? He, he, here's why you ought to wait, because number one, God will incline and hear. <laughs> yeah, I know y'all didn't see, y'all didn't catch that. Let me back it up. It, it's right here. He says, he says, he inclined to me and heard my cry. I'm glad you want to know about that, because here's what he's saying. God is making some strategic moves. Why you feel like he's not responding, here's what the writer says, here's what David says, he inclined. I like that word inclined because it means this, it means God will stretch and bend over. Y'all, excuse me. It means wherever you are, God is going to make an extraordinary effort to stretch to where you are in the circumstances that you're in. And look, wait a minute, somebody gonna shout on this. He's gonna bend over and incline his ear to hear about your situation. Now, I, I know y'all got problems, y'all don't understand that. But when I look at my life and how jacked up I am and how messed up I am and how many mistakes I've made and where I've fallen and how I think and the words that I ponder and the things that are murmuring around in my heart, God does not like to dwell in sinful places. But God says, as sinful as you are, I'll reach over, I'll stretch myself to come into your ugly domicile and incline my ear to hear what your situation is. Oh, I feel a shout coming on me right now because if the truth be told sometimes I feel so jacked up I feel so toe up from the flow up that God could not possibly hear my cry but right here David reminds me that God will turn aside from his activities and duties that's what that's also what incline means not only that he will stretch and hear but he will turn aside Woo, he'll turn uh, he'll make a turn from his normal duties to come and see about your situation. I, I, I know that that's, I, I'm trying to explain it because it's, see, see the thing about the God that we serve is in our view, he's turning aside, but he is such a multitasking God. Go on, Pastor. That he can handle your situation while he handles everything else. Y'all, excuse me. He, he, he doesn't have to put anything on hold to come and see about you. He can fix your situation while he's fixing everybody on your role situation at the same time. Somebody say he's inclining. He's hearing. 
He's turning aside to see about my situation. I like that. And he will hear. He will listen. He will perceive. He will pay attention to. He will give attention to. I like that. He's going to hear me. Now, here's where, here's where the drama occurs because some of you have tuned God out. You have, you, have, you have shut the door on God from being able to hear you even though he has the capacity because your attitude ain't right. You see... David said, I patiently waited. I waited patiently. I, 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 I put myself in a situation of high expectation and bound, being bound together with God so that he inclined his ear. Now, here's the deal. When you get upset, mad, angry, stop talking to God, you got an attitude, then God can't hear you. Y'all excuse me for a second. He doesn't respond to your pity parties. He does not respond to your temper tantrums. Y'all y'all ain't got to say nothing. He saw you cussing people out. He saw you giving people a piece of your mind, the little bit of peace that you had. He saw you telling folk off. He heard what has been pondered in your heart. And what you don't realize is that when you enter into that domain, you enter into a domain, a domain that shuts God off from having the capacity to respond to you. Because it's, it's like this. I was in the store the other day. It's a great illustration. I was in the airport. We're in the airport. Uh, I was flying uh, from Orlando, Florida, coming back to Maryland, uh, and there was a thousand kids, and, and I, I wanted to take some of them kids. And <laughs> I saw a family where the daughter, the little girl, just threw an outright temper tantrum uh yeah 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 she rolled on the floor and she started crying Woo, i had to contain myself from <laughs> y'all don't know what i'm talking about y'all don't my parents would have done one of two things ignored me they would not have done what these parents did, which was enter into a negotiating session. Negotiating with a child. <laughs> I'm doing this not for the child, for the parents is who I want to jack them up. All my parents would have picked my behind up and began to minister to me. <laughs> In, <laughs> in a language that would have conformed my behavior immediately. Do I have anybody who had parents like me? And yet some of you are doing the very thing with God. You're throwing a temper tantrum. You're getting upset. You're questioning his existence and questioning his power because he has not responded to you as quickly as you wanted. But here's what captures the art of God. What catches the ear and captures the heart of God is when a person says, I don't mind waiting. I don't, I don't mind waiting. I'll patiently wait. I know I'm going to be, I know in due season and in due time, God will step into the circumstances of my dilemma and he will resolve my problem and he will answer my prayer but all I've got to do is learn how to stick with God and keep on having an expectation that God is going to do something fabulous. Anybody know that we serve a fabulous God? I say do anybody here know that we serve a fabulous God? As a matter of fact it says he will incline to me and he heard my cry he said. That word, that word cry means your appeal for help. I'm not telling you don't tell God that you need some help, but please let it be in the right spirit and the right attitude. That word cry means I'm making an appeal for God about my circumstances. Cry doesn't mean that you are complaining and you're grouchy with tears. The word cry means you are asking God for his help. You are acknowledging that you realize that by your own strength and power, you cannot change your circumstance. But just saying to God that I can't do it by my own power and my own might. I need some help, God. Can you help me? And we serve a God that has the ability to help those who realize how helpless they are. Before you get up and dance on this very pointed point, let me roll on and give you point two so you'll have two things to shout about. Not only will God 
incline and hear, but according to verse 2, it says, He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and establish my steps. Let me give you point two. God will bring you up to set you up. Somebody say he gonna bring you up to set you up. I know y'all can't say it because you're writing. You can't write and talk at the same time. Let me give you a moment to go ahead and write the point down because you're going to need to bring this back to your remembrance in the very near future. And you're going to need to remind yourself that God will bring me up to set me up. He will bring me up to set me up. Somebody say, he will bring me up to set me up. What is he bringing you up? He, he says, he, will, he brought me up out of a horrible pit. That word pit means a hole, a prison, a dungeon. Anybody here knows what it's like to be down in something that you cannot get yourself out of. Y'all eight o'clock people get on my nerves acting like y'all been saved all your lives. You ain't been saved all your life. You got some history, you got some background and some of y'all's history is last week. Y'all may not want to admit it. He will bring you up out of the pit, the dungeon, the hole, the prison of your circumstance. God sees the, the hole that you're in. He sees the pit. And, and I like what David says, he brought me up out of it. I feel like shouting right now. I didn't climb out. I, I, I didn't pull myself up by my bootstraps. I didn't do it by my own strength of might. But God himself reached down into the domain of my mess and brought me up out of it. It was by his power that it occurred. It was by his might that it happened. He brought me out of a horrible place. Matter of fact, it wasn't just a pit, it was a horrible pit. And that word horrible means to crash, to destroy. Some of you are in a pit based on things you've done and said, behavior that you exhibited that caused you to flame out, uh, put you in a hot mess. <laughs> yeah, that's what it is, a hot mess. But here's the great news. You might be in a horrible pit, but patiently wait on the Lord. He can bring you up out of that pit. And hold up, there's something else about that pit. He says, out of the miry clay. That word miry clay means muddy dirt and there's a unique characteristic about this muddy dirt it's sticky some of y'all are in situations that's sticky <laughs> kind of sticky right here uh, matter of fact it's so sticky that everything you touch stays attached to you stuff y'all 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 this is the crowd that act like they don't know what I'm talking about it's kind of sticky and and, and every time you try to get out, it's, it's holding you back. But here's what God does. He will bring you up out of, I feel a shout coming on. He will, he will reach down and has the power. I don't care how low you are, how often you've done it. I don't care how long it's been in your life. Does not matter that you may have concluded in your own heart and mind that you can never change this thing in your life. I got some great news for you that the Jesus that we serve understands your situation and he has the power to pick you up out of it. Wait a minute before y'all shout too loud. Matter of fact, he will not only bring me up out of the horrible pit and out of the miry clay, he will set my feet on a rock. He gonna bring you out to set you up. He gonna bring you up to set you up. He said, I'm gonna set your feet. He's going to, listen, here's what the word set means. It means that God is going to cause you to arise. That's what the word means, to arise and be what it is God called you to be. Some of y'all are down in a pit in the miry clay and you are living beneath what God has assigned for you to live in your life. But oh, I got some great news for somebody today. We serve a God that will come into your domain and I give him the praise that he will cause you to rise up and become everything he's called you to be. Matter of fact, he's going to help you fulfill the mandate that he has established for your life. As a matter of fact, the text says, 
I like this. He says, he is going to set you, he's going to set your feet upon a rock. He's going, and the word feet means your path, your life, your walk, how you live your life. You know you got those habits and those things that keep dragging you down? Hallelujah. When you learn how to patiently wait with the right attitude on God, y'all, some of y'all are using the excuses of your dilemma not changing to be a justification for your behavior. Let me roll that back and give it to you again. Some of you are using the fact that your circumstances has not changed and you've been praying about it and God has not answered it. You are using that as a justification for your behavior. Let me roll it back and give it to you again. You cannot use your unresolved issues as a justification for why you are doing the stuff you ain't got no business doing. Look at your name and say, you can't justify it, dog. Tell them. I said, look at that joker next to you and tell them you can't justify it. Tell them on the other side. Go ahead, put the attitude with it. Put the finger and the head thing. Say, you can't justify it. But God says, I'm going to set you up. I'm going to pull you up out of it. And I'm going to put, I'm going to cause you to rise up and be what it is I've ordained and destined for you to be in your life. Matter of fact, he says, I'm going to set you on a rock and I'm going to establish your steps. I feel a shout coming on me right there. He says, I'm gonna take your feet and put you on a solid rock. You've been in that clay. You've been in that miry, sticky, miry clay. And the more you move, the deeper in you go. Y'all, excuse me. The more you try to get out, the more you end up doing it. Y'all, excuse me. You say, I ain't gonna do it no more. Then you go and do it again. Y'all, excuse me. You say, I ain't gonna go there. Then you go there. That's the miry clay. But God says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring you up out of there, set you on a rock, and establish your steps so that you're going to be walking and living the way I've ordained and called for you to walk and live. That's the kind of God that we are serving. Y'all, excuse me. I feel a shout coming on me today. When I think of the goodness of Jesus, and all that he has done for me my soul cries out hallelujah thank god for saving me he saved me he washed me he cleansed me he redeemed me he delivered me he did it all he's the one he did it you can't do it he does it he established my feet Establish my steps. Set me on a rock. As a matter of fact, that word rock means a cliff that is a stronghold of Je Jehovah. It's his hiding place. It's his place of strength. Let me hurry up. It's almost nine o'clock. I got six minutes to bring it on in. Y'all supposed to say, take your time, Pastor. But not this here crowd. The game ain't on till tomorrow night, y'all. We got time. And let me go ahead and prophetically prophesy. You don't want me to declare it because it shall come to pass. Somebody gonna get spanked tomorrow night. Lord, please don't let me have to eat my words next week. <laughs> Number three. What was the first thing I said? He didn't climb in here. What was number two? He will bring you up to set you up. Here's number three. He'll give you a new song to sing. He has put a new song in my mouth. God will give you and bestow and provide for you a new song. He will help you sing. Some of y'all has lost your song, but I come to declare to you, God's about to give you a new song to sing. 
you've been singing the blues long enough. He gonna give you a song of praise and a song of celebration and a song of shouting and a song of honor and glory to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He will make you sing. Let me close this. Here's what I like about this. Verse three says, he has put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. Many will see it and fear and will trust in the Lord. Here's the deal. Let me close on this point. People are watching you and how you are handling your dilemma. They've been observing the struggles that you are facing. Quietly as it's kept, people are watching you and you don't even realize the folks who are looking at you. They say, you claim to be saved. You're going down there to that church all the time. Let's see how you're going to handle this drama. But when you patiently wait, when you have expectation that somehow, I don't know when, I don't know where, but somehow God is going to step in and do something. When you walk with the posture to say, I'm expecting God to move. I don't know when, I don't know how, but I'm expecting him to do something. And I'm going to still praise him and live for him and honor him and pray to him and obey him even though I'm in the thick of trouble. In due season, I know I'm going to reap. They are watching you and here's what's going to happen. When God brings you out and sets you up and God puts a new song in your mouth and you are singing louder now than you did before, the people who have been watching you will say that perhaps since God did it for them, he might do something for me. Anybody who know what I'm talking about? Holly, if he did it for me, he'll do it for you. If he delivered me, he'll deliver you. If he brought me out, he can bring you out. He's a God that is not short of power. He can bring you out. Well, let me close with this. This is Psalm 40. Let me close with Isaiah 40. I'm trying to bring y'all into a new dimension of a day. I told you a couple weeks we're going to turn your 9-11 into a 10-10. Well, let me bring on top of the 10-10 a 40-40. <laughs> a Psalm 40 and an Isaiah 40. Y'all excuse me for just a second. Isaiah 40 says, he gives power to the weak, verse 20, 29. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Y'all excuse me, but I don't mind waiting. I don't mind waiting on the Lord. I'm waiting on you, Lord, patiently waiting. I'm not worried about the time, because Lord, I know I seem to find strength while I'm waiting on you. That's all I'm trying to tell you today, that there are some benefits in waiting on the Lord. Wait on him and be of good courage. He shall renew your strength and restore your joy. Give God a shout with me if you don't mind. Tell your neighbor, I don't mind waiting. High five them, say, I don't mind waiting. Waiting, 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 it's okay, I don't mind waiting. I'll wait on the Lord, I'll wait on the Lord, I'll wait on the Lord, I'll wait on the Lord. High expectation, I'm looking for God to do something. Hallelujah. Who was I preaching to this morning? Let me pray for you. With arms stretched up high, these are your children, God. Some who are discouraged by the circumstances of life, the challenges, the burdens that they face. And I want to pray this morning that you give us a heart and a spirit of patience. Help us to patiently wait. Help us, God, not to lose our faith and what you will do and what you're going to do. I pray, God, that you would lift somebody up out of the horrible pit, somebody who is stuck in miry clay, 
who cannot get out of the circumstance that they're in, cannot get out of the sin that they've been entangled by, draw them today to come and say yes to you, to yield their lives to you. I pray, Father, that their confidence would be in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection, that they would turn their hearts to him and that you would cleanse and redeem them. In Jesus' marvelous and magnificent name we pray. Amen and amen. Today's dynamic message from Pastor Jenkins is one that has the power to change your life, but it can only do so if you have a heart and soul that belong to Jesus Christ. Perhaps you want to be able to make such a claim, but you don't know how. It's simple. You just have to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and rose again with all power. Your sins are now forgiven, and you're part of the family of God. Welcome. Maybe you're already saved and in need of a church home, one that will nurture your growth and development as a Christian. Or perhaps you were once in fellowship with God, but have since drifted away and are ready to return to your first love. Whatever the case, we'd love to have you become a part of the First Baptist family. Simply contact us at 301-773-3600 or visit our website at www.fbcglenarden.org for more information on any one of our four convenient services or our 100 plus ministries designed to meet your most intimate needs. First Baptist Church of Glenarden, where God is developing dynamic disciples.